Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of Digital Fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn. Today is day three of spoiler season for Modern Horizons 3. Technically, it's about day four, but I'm getting to this video kind of late. That being said, we're going to get through all of the day three spoilers, and I'm going to get right to work on day four, so you can expect the next video pretty soon after this one. But I digress. We're going to get right into it. Before we do, make sure you like the video if you haven't already. It's you guys liking the video every single time that have helped this channel to grow so quickly. And I appreciate the hell out of you guys. So thank you so much. If you're new here, subscribe so you never miss an upload. Tons of spoiler content. Tons of cool deck techs coming. And some really cool news in that I've been invited to early access... Uh, the early access streamer event for Modern Horizons 3. So I will be streaming that. Probably be a 24 hour stream, which will be crazy. You can find me over on Twitch where I stream live. That's twitch.tv slash quarantine Capricorn. Because if I'm alive and I'm breathing, I'm there and I'm streaming. I'll probably put up a more formal announcement of the fact that I'm going to be partaking in early access pretty soon, but just figured I'd give you guys a heads up in this video since I do know that already. And we're going to move right onto the cards. So, first up, we've got Cranial Ram. This is just 2 mana for an artifact equipment in the colors of Rakdos. It's a living weapon, so when you play it, you get a 0-0 Black Phyrexian Germ creature token uh, that this becomes attached to, which is really cool. It equips for 2 mana if you want to move it to a different creature, and then it gives equipped creature plus X plus 1, where X is the number of artifacts you control. So, obviously in a go-wide artifact deck an affinity for artifacts style deck this is going to be absolutely insane get a huge power creature on the board that even if the creature dies you can just turn your other creature you know into an insanely high powered creature as well seems pretty crazy i can't wait to draft into this archetype uh during early access i think it'll be super fun next up we've got temperamental oonswag Ooz oozwag Temper temperamental ooze wag one green and three for a four four ooze brush wag it adapts two for one green and two which means if it doesn't have any counters on it you can pay that three mana and it gets two plus one plus one counters put on it becomes a six six modified creatures you control have trample so when it does become adapted it's going to give itself trample but even before that happens it can just give all of your other creatures that have counters on them trample uh, also, just to note that modified creatures aren't just creatures with counters, right? It's also anything that has an equipment equipped or an aura attached to it. Uh, so, kind of cool versatility here. It'll be pretty interesting to see if this is an archetype in Limited. Uh, I'm excited to, to mess around with it for sure. Next up, we've got Mandibular Kite. One white mana for an artifact equipment. This is another living weapon, so it's going to generate a 0-0 Black Phyrexian Germ creature token when it enters the battlefield, and then you attach the kite to it. It's pretty interesting that all of the living weapon cards, regardless of color, they make a black creature token, which is uh, kind of interesting. But equipped creature gets plus one, plus one, and flying, uh, and it equips for one white and three. So it is really expensive to re-equip, but the fact that you just get a one, one flyer for one mana when you first play this, and you do have the ability to use that as a mana sink later on, attach it to a different creature that's really, really big, that just needs to get through and win the game for you, right? Give it evasion. Seems... Seems pretty good for a common. Next up, we've got Galvanic Discharge. One red for an instant. Choose a creature or planeswalker. You get three energy, and then you may pay any amount of energy. Galvanic Discharge deals that much damage to that permanent. So at the very least, this is just a lightning bolt, right? It's a lightning bolt that is one mana, instant speed, deal three damage to a creature or planeswalker. Granted, it can't hit the head. Um, but the upside here is if you have more energy, you can do way, way, way more damage still for just a one mana removal spell, which is kind of crazy. And another piece of upside is the complete flip side of that coin is if you only need to do one or two damage to something to kill it, but that's still the primary target that you need to get rid of, you can actually be left with a little bit of energy left over from this for some of your other spells later on which is really, really cool. So, a lot of versatility with this. I'm loving what I'm seeing. Next up, we've got Expanding Ooze. This is 3 mana for a 3-3 Ooze with Adapt 1 in the colors of Golgari. And the Adapt cost is 2 mana in the colors of Golgari as well. And whenever Expanding Ooze attacks, you put a plus one plus one counter on target modified creature you control. So, kind of interesting. You have to have your creatures be modified first for them to continue to get counters from the ooze, but there's a lot of adapt in this set, 
So I think the idea with the Golgari archetype in Limited is you want to be playing a lot of adapt creatures, uh, you know, adapting your creatures, making them bigger, and then using things like Expanding Ooze and the other card that we saw to then add even more value onto your creatures that are adapted. Kind of cool. Should be fun to see if this uh, this actually pans out as a limited archetype. Next up, we've got our first uncommon. This is Triton Wavebreaker. Just one blue mana for an enchantment creature, Merfolk Wizard. It also has Bestow for one blue and one, which means it can be played from the graveyard for that cost, but it comes back as an enchantment enchanting one of your creatures, which is pretty cool. Now, as a 1-1 one, one for one, uh, it has Prowess. If, it, if it's a creature, it has prowess, so it comes down as a 1-1 one, one prowess for 1 mana. And then enchanted creature gets plus 1, plus 1, and prowess. So when it comes back with that bestow cost, it's going to give a creature prowess as well as giving them a little bit of a buff. So pretty cool. Next up, we've got Path of Annihilation. 1 green and 3 for an enchantment. It does have Devoid, so it's technically no color, even though it does cost green mana. When it enters the battlefield, you get to create 2... 0-1 colorless Eldrazi spawn creature tokens that can sacrifice to add a colorless Hedron mana. And Eldrazi you control have the ability to tap and add one mana of any color. And then, if that wasn't enough, whenever you cast a creature spell with mana value 7 or greater, you gain 4 life. So this just seems like it's a limited enabler for big over-the-top Eldrazi techs in a limited format, which is kind of crazy. Uh, you can use your Eldrazi spawn tokens to generate mana to just ramp out your your big Eldrazi guys super quick, but then also gain four life every time you put out one of those big creatures. Uh, this kind of just seems like it does everything. It would be pretty decent even if it didn't give you two Eldrazi Scions or two Eldrazi spawn creatures when it entered the battlefield, but the fact that it gives you two mana producers right off the bat that can not only tap for mana but also sack for mana, it kind of refunds all of the mana that you spent on it, right? Because you get these two creatures that on the next turn they can each tap for a mana and then after tapping for a mana can sack for a mana as well and give you all four of your mana back as well as still having all of your lands untapped so that you can cast something really, really huge. So even if you just use those Eldrazi right away to ramp something out, you can ramp something out super huge the very next turn or you can save up all your spawn creatures, go wide with a bunch of spawn creatures, and just use them for mana of any color turn after turn after turn. So, just a lot of value in this. I kind of love it. Next up, we've got Royal Cartographer. One blue and one for a 1-3 Merfolk Rogue with Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get an energy counter. You can also tap it and pay six energy counters to draw three cards. So, even just getting free energy by landfalling is kind of nuts on this card. It's a decent body as a blocker, as a two drop, and just gives you tons of extra free energy for your energy spells on top of whatever energy you're gonna be actually generating with those spells to begin with, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but then you also have this, you know, energy dump where if you have a bunch of energy later in the game and don't have anything better to use it with, you can dump all six energy into this and draw three cards, gas up your hand, and keep going to town, so I think the energy deck is looking kind of insane in Limited. Uh, there might even be one that's constructed worthy, to be completely honest. Energy is by far the most interesting mechanic in this set for me, so far at least. If you agree with that, let me know in the comments. Uh, if you disagree, let me know what your, your most exciting, or what you think is the most exciting uh, archetype or sort of uh, mechanic build around style concept in this set. I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts. Next up, we've got Signature Slam. This is one green and two for an instant. You put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. And then each modified creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So, a lot of value here, right? You get a plus one, plus one counter no matter what, but then you get to do damage equal to all of your modified creatures. Uh, which is kind of insane. It should be pretty easy for the modified deck to take out any of the big Eldrazi's with this, even with a very, you know, uh, mediocre board state, to be completely honest, because this is going to grab from all of your modified creatures, so pretty cool card. Next up, we've got Reckless Pyro Surfer. One red and one for a 2-2 Human Scout with Haste. It's already kind of decent. 2-2 Haste for two is, is a nice... You know, it's it's a nice floor to build off of. 
It has a landfall whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. Reckless Pyro Surfer gains Battle Cry until end of turn. That's kind of insane. So as long as you're not missing your land drops each turn, this thing's just a 2-2 haste. It's it's a 2-2 haste, haste battle cry. <laughs> just pretty much always, unless it's a turn where you miss a land drop. That seems just kind of insane. I don't know, that seems really, really good in an aggressive deck. We'll we'll have to see when the set when the set launches. Next up we've got Copy Crook. This is two blue and two. For a 0, zero Shapeshifter Rogue, you may have Copy Crook enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it has whenever this creature attacks, it connives. So kind of insane. Uh, it's pretty good in and of itself that it can just be a copy of an opponent's creature if you need it to be. If your opponent plays some really bomby creature that they're taking over the game with, you can at least meet them, match them with that board presence by making a copy of it. You can also just copy your best creature if you want, and then you have this extra value of conniving that's going to dig for cards you need, which should be super good and limited, uh, because you have smaller decks, 40 card decks, so anything that's scrying, conniving, digging for cards in your deck, getting you closer to your bombs is going to be way better and limited. So I think this guy is insane and limited. <laughs> I kind of love him. Um, I don't know if he's quite there for Constructed. Is there a Constructed deck that could use this guy? Really not sure, but we're going to move on. Next up, we've got Marionette Apprentice. This is one that we saw during leak season. This card is insane. One black and one for a 1-2 human artificer with Fabricate 1. So it can come in with a plus one plus one counter, or when it comes in, it can make a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. And whenever another creature or artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses a life. So kind of like a Blood Artist, blood artist kind of like a Disciple of the Vault, the fact that you get to basically ping them whenever a creature or an artifact dies, having both of those things be able to trigger this makes it kind of insane, and being able to create an artifact creature that can be sacrificed and, and ping with this when it enters is just insane, insane gravy. So... I love this card, I think it's going to be everywhere, I'd be surprised if there wasn't a really cool limited archetype that this slots into, I'd be even more surprised if this doesn't see play in Constructed, because I think the card is just that good. If you agree, let me know in the comments. But moving on, we've got Reef Worm. This is 1 blue and 3 for a 0-1 worm. When it dies, you create a 3-3 blue fish creature token that has, when this creature dies, create a 6-6 blue whale creature token that has, when this creature dies, create a 9-9 blue kraken creature token. So, sure, it's a 0-1 for 4 mana, and that sucks, but it eats through 3 pieces of removal, theoretically. Or I guess the first copy won't eat through removal, right? No one's going to use their removal on a 0-1. But if you just sacrifice this to a sack outlet, get some kind of payoff for sacrificing it, and then get a 3-3, well now you have something that can trade with an opponent's creature and then become a 6-6, and then they have to use removal on it at that point, and it becomes a 9-9, and they have to use removal on it again. So if you can manage to get all of the value out of this card throughout the course of the game, it's absolutely insane. It's kind of a 4-for-1, four and that is going to take, I think, a combination of ways to get rid of this yourself, maybe sacrificing it, and uh, and also then becoming a bigger threat that your opponent has to use removal on. So it's going to take a combination of those things to really get all of the value out of this card, but the potential is absolutely insane. I kind of love it. Uh, it's one of those cards that just seems really, really fun to try to build around with sack outlets and stuff, uh, and I'll ac absolutely be trying to uh, build something. Next up, we've got Dreadmobile. Uh, this is a 3-3 artifact vehicle with menace for one black and two. And then you can pay one and sacrifice another artifact or another creature to put a plus one plus one counter on Dreadmobile. And then it crews for just one. So 3-3 three, three menace for three that crews for just one is pretty decent in and of itself. But the fact that you have another sacrifice outlet here where you can sack things that maybe you already want to be sacking anyway, like the last couple cards that we saw, um, to get extra value is really, really nice. Like the plus one plus one counters here are great, but it's really just gravy. It's having a way to sacrifice things that you want to sacrifice that really puts this card over the top and at instant speed. So pretty cool. Uh, I expect it to see play in the sacrifice style deck in limited, whatever deck that is. 
But moving on, we've got Pyretic Rebirth. This is four mana for an instant. It uh, in the colors of Rakdos. Return target artifact or creature card from your graveyard to your hand, and then Pyretic Rebirth deals damage equal to that card's mana value to up to one target creature or planeswalker. So not only does this get you back your best artifact or creature, but it's also removal on the same card. And I think that's what puts it over the top. Honestly, cards like this that usually get stuff back to your hand, they're very slow. Uh, they cost a lot of tempo in order to actually take the time you need to get the thing back and then replay it and all of that. So sometimes those cards are hard to use, especially in a limited environment where you need to be quicker, where you can't afford to take a turn off. Um, but the fact that you have removal stapled onto this kind of solves that problem. You don't have to worry about getting back something that's cheap enough that you can play at the same turn so that you can still impact the board. You can get back your absolute best card that's a bomb, and even if you don't have the mana to play it until the next turn, like you still get to remove a huge threat on the opponent's side uh, just as a side effect, which is really, really awesome. So I kind of love it. It's going to work even better in decks that want to put things in their graveyard, like self-mill or sacrifice decks, so that you can always make sure you have a good target for this. Um, but I think it'll be decently good just in general. Next up, we've got a whole bunch of modal double face cards that come into play as lands on the backside. But before that, coffee break. Now, while I'm grabbing some Nectar of the Gods, I just want to remind everybody really quick that I am partaking in Early Access. I believe it's happening June 6th, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be a 24-hour stream for me over on Twitch. So that's twitch.tv slash quarantine Capricorn. I'd love to have you guys there for it. Also, I want to apologize. With the changing of the seasons, my allergies have been awful. So if you see me kind of sniffling a little bit, or if it sounds like I'm talking with a bubble in my throat, uh, it's me trying to deal with my allergies, and I'm doing the best I can to get through it and get this video out to all of you guys. So, thanks for your understanding. Let's get back to the cards. Nectar of the Gods. <sighs> Nectar of the Gods. Moving on, we've got Razor Grash. Raz Razor Grash. Razor Grass Ambush. This is one white and one for an instant. It deals three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. So your typical removal spell for attacking or blocking creatures at instant speed in white. But then on the back side, it can also just be played as a land. Come into the battlefield uh, untapped if you're willing to pay three life. Otherwise, it comes in tapped. And then it taps for one white mana. This is Razor Grass Field. Next up, we've got the blue one, Sink into Stupor, and I believe we saw this during leak season, but this is two blue and one for an instant. Return target spell or non-land permanent an opponent controls to its owner's hand. So nice little bit of temporary removal here, but it's cool that can it can hit a spell, almost like a counter spell, but also hit, you know, permanence in play and act as removal for things your opponent has already gotten into play. And then if you don't need either of those, you can just play it as a land, Soporific Springs, enters the battlefield tapped unless you pay three life, and then taps for one blue mana. Next up, we've got Fell the Profane. This is the black one in the cycle. Two black and two for an instant. It destroys target creature or planeswalkers. So really awesome to see just straight up instant speed removal here as the front side. That's going to be really, really powerful and a very high pick uh, in draft for sure. And then the back side is Fellmire. Enters the battlefield uh, tapped unless you pay three life again. And it taps for one black mana. The red one is Sundering Eruption, one red and two for a sorcery, destroy target land, its controller may search their library for a basic land, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. Also creatures without flying can't block this turn, so kind of cool that it has almost like two spells built, built into one, I didn't really expect that for this. Uh, but that makes it kind of versatile, right? Because you can use it for either or in situations where you just need one or the other. And then in some situations, like both modes at the same time is going to matter, which is really cool. And if you need the land, it can enter as Volcanic Fissure, which again enters the battlefield tapped unless you pay three life and taps for one red mana. The green one is Bridge Works Battle, one green and two for a sorcery. Target creature you control gets plus two, plus two until end of turn and then it fights up to one target creature you don't control. So 
Nice little bit of removal here with buff stapled on. Should be really, really good in green. And if you need the land, it can enter the battlefield as Tangle Span Bridge Works. It enters tapped unless you pay the three life, and then you tap for one green mana. Next up, we've got our first rare of the day. Now, this is another one that we saw during leak season, but we're going to go over it since it's officially announced now. This is Harbinger of the Seas. Two blue and one for a 2-2 Merfolk Wizard. Non-basic lands are islands. So this is basically Blood Moon stapled to a creature, except instead of mountains, it's islands. This is going to be really good uh, in a lot of different ways. Granted, it is a creature, so it's more susceptible to removal. It's easier to get rid of this. In response to them playing, you could tap your lands for mana, and then after it enters the battlefield, you could use that mana to use removal on it to get rid of it right away. So you are going to have to kind of play around things, um, get around creature removal to make this stick. But the fact that it's islands and not mountains has its upside too. There are plenty of cards with island walk that can take advantage of this, right? And just a lot of a lot of ways to shut down decks that you can't shut down with Blood Moon, right? If you're up against a, a deck that's strong in red but using a lot of non-basic lands, normally a Blood Moon, right, is still going to give them access to red mana and not shut them down as effectively, whereas Harbinger of the Seas here can shut down decks like that way more effectively because it turns everything into islands. So, pretty cool card. I think it's going to be really, really powerful. I don't know what constructed deck is going to want to use it, but if you have ideas, definitely let me know in the comments. Next up, we've got Disruptor Flute. This is two mana for an artifact with flash. When it enters the battlefield, you choose a card name. Spells with the chosen name cost three more to cast, which is kind of interesting. And activated abilities of sources with the chosen name can't be activated at all unless they're mana abilities. So this card is really, really good. If you know what's in your opponent's hand, you can make it very difficult for them to cast the thing they need to cast next. But you can also use this in really clever ways. Like if they're playing Planeswalkers, let's say they're playing a Wandering Emperor, right? You could flash this in in response and name Wandering Emperor and immediately shut down all of the loyalty abilities of the Wandering Emperor, so a lot of versatility here, making it hard for them to play things, shutting down Planeswalkers, just a really cool card. Next up we've got Primal Prayers, we also saw this one during League Season, this is 2 green and 2 for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you get 2 energy counters. You may cast creature spells with mana value 3 or less by paying green rather than, or sorry, by paying an energy rather than paying their mana costs. And if you cast a spell this way, you may cast it as though it had flash. Kind of insane. If you're in a deck that's just full of 3 drops, and you're generating a ton of energy, well now you could just, at instant speed on your opponent's turn, just vomit out 3 drops for just 1 energy each. At instant speed, with flash, in the middle of combat if you want to, and all it costs is 1 energy per spell. That seems crazy. This card kind of reminds me of a collected company, with the downside being it doesn't get to dig for things off the top of your top of your deck. You have to have those creatures that you want to play in hand. But it does allow you, even with just the energy it creates itself, to get two three drops into play for a four mana spell. The difference being on the upside, the fact that Primal Prayer sticks around forever and you can continue to cast three drops for one energy each if you have extra energy or if you go on to make extra energy later on. So... There's pros and cons for sure, it's not a strictly better collected company or anything like that, but it is similar and different and has its upsides and downsides, and the upsides are pretty crazy if you're in a deck that's deep into energy, so I think this card is kinda nuts. But next up we've got Estrid's Invocation, this is 1 blue and 2 for an enchantment. When it enters, you may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of an enchantment you control, Except it has, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may exile this enchantment if you do return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So, really cool here. The fact that it can be a copy of any enchantment you want is pretty, pretty interesting. But the other part of the ability is actually more interesting. Because they could have just made it so that you can choose a new enchantment for it to be a, become a copy of every upkeep, right? And it would have functionally done the same thing. At least on the surface. 
but it's actually deeper than that by having it enter the battlefield and then re-enter as whatever enchantment it allows you to get etb abilities of enchantments that you otherwise would not be able to get um, it also allows you to trigger chapter one on a saga if you have it enter as a saga which is also really interesting so there's added value here to it becoming exiled and re-entering the battlefield as the copy of the thing instead of just picking a different target to become a copy of during your upkeep and i think that's very intentional i think being able to get these etb triggers off of other enchantments being able to get a saga that triggers chapter one immediately instead of having to sit around an entire turn cycle which is what a saga would have to do if you just were able to choose a different target and choose to target the, the saga um to become a copy of so really really cool i'm excited to brew with this and see what it can do and my guess is there's got to be a lot of enchantments in this set that specifically have etb abilities or are sagas to kind of get that extra value out of this card in order to warrant it warrant it being worded that way right so i don't know we'll have to see but if, if you have any ideas about specifically extra value we can get off of this because it enters the battlefield and it can get that enters the battlefield value let me know in the comments because i'm interested to hear what you guys' thoughts are on what kind of cards this can actually break wide open it seems like the potential is definitely there next up we've got sewing myco spawn this is one green and three for a three three eldrazi fungus with devoid so it's technically it has no color even though you have to spend green mana to play it it also has Kicker for two colorless, one being a colorless Hedron mana. And when you cast this spell, you search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffled. Uh, then shuffle, you do that no matter what, even if you don't pay the Kicker cost. But if it was kicked, you also get to exile a land. And what's really cool about that is... They don't get the land back if the creature leaves the battlefield. Most of the times when we get these abilities that exile things uh, when a permanent enters the battlefield or when it's cast or whatever, usually you have some kind of clause where they get value back if the thing leaves the battlefield. With this one, they don't, right? You just exile a land, it's just gone forever. They don't get a basic to replace it or any of that. Granted, you have to spend a total of six mana in order to make that happen, which is a lot and I think helps balance the card out. But it is a ton of value, uh, and I kind of love that about this card. Um, and being able to search for a land no matter what, put it onto the battlefield, it enters the battlefield untapped, unless it has a line of text on it that makes it enter tapped, you know? So you get to use that mana right away. Just seems really good all around, and uh, I'm excited to uh, try this. Next up, we've got another one that was spoiled during uh, leak season. Of course, we have a new art to look at here. This is Imskir Iron Eater. 8 mana, a whopping 8 mana for a 5-5 legendary demon. But the catch here is it has affinity for artifacts. So if you have 6 artifacts on the battlefield, this thing can come down as a 5-5 for only 2 mana, which is crazy. When he enters the battlefield, you draw X cards and lose X life, where X is half the number of artifacts you control, rounded down, so it doubles down on that go-wide strategy with artifacts, where you get to draw a bunch of cards. It almost reminds me a little bit of, like, a, um, a, uh, Void... What is that card called? The, uh... I forget the name of it. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. It was in Ravnica. It was two mana in Simic and X. The guy, the Crassus. That's it. The Crassus. It reminds me of Crassus. Although, with Crassus, you had to spend a bunch of mana in order to scale it. With this, you just have to have a bunch of artifacts in order to scale it and, and draw more cards. So, it's definitely different. It goes in a different deck, but it just kind of thematically has a similar vibe, I feel, to the Crassus. Uh, but, but obviously if you're playing an artifact deck with a ton of go wide artifacts, like this is just going to be nutty. This is going to come down for two mana, be a five, five, draw you a bunch of cards. Sure. You have to have the life, uh, to make sure that you can afford to pay in order to get those cards. So maybe you do want some life gain in that deck as well. Is there a deck that goes wide with artifacts and gets you a little bit of extra life as you go to help fuel something like this? I don't know. But 
It doesn't stop there. It also has an activated ability for one red and three. You can sacrifice an artifact and then deal damage equal to that artifact's mana value to any target. So this card kind of does everything. It seems like it's really, really good as a commander in an affinity for artifacts style deck. Um, and even though it keeps getting commander attacks, if you just keep going even wider with artifacts, you're still getting that cost reduction on the commander tax. You can still keep playing this for just two mana time after time after time from your command zone, theoretically. So when you take that into account, when you take into account the fact that every time you do play it, you get to draw cards and it has this ability to turn your artifacts into removal, either for their creatures or their planeswalkers, or also as a way to just finish the game and do damage to their head. This card just kind of does everything. As long as you're in the right deck, this card just does everything. It seems insane. I'm excited to build this honestly for Brawl when it's live on Arena, so you'll probably see that deck coming. In fact, if, if you tune in for early access over on Twitch, I'll probably play that deck at some point. But next up, we've got the very last card of today. This is Shifting Woodland. It's a land that enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a forest. You can tap it for one green mana, and it has Delirium. So you can pay two green and two, and Shifting Woodland becomes a copy of any permanent card in your graveyard until end of turn, but you can only activate that if there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard. This can be really, really crazy. Um, you can have it become a creature and just swing in and close out a game that way if it becomes something really, really big. You can have it become an artifact or an enchantment to get certain abilities online, like the sky's kind of the limit for this. It's obviously going to be that much better in a deck that's trying to fill up their graveyard if you're in a self-mill style deck or whatnot, um, and you have more targets to choose from quicker earlier in the game. Uh, you know, you can get more value out of something like this, being able to, like, pay four mana and turn this into your huge Eldrazi bomb creature that would normally cost 13 and be able to swing in with, like, Annihilator and crazy keywords and all that seems really good. It seems like you could do that pretty early in a game, uh, but I kind of love that it's balanced out by the fact that all of those big Eldrazi you can expect to see in this set have a lot of cast triggers, and the, the draw and the allure to a lot of those cards is the cast trigger, and you can't get that with Shifting Woodland, which helps balance it out. That being said, you don't really need that stuff, right? It's going to be insane to just turn this into a big, bomby creature that you can swing with super early in the game. Like, turn four, if you're able to self-mill stuff early enough. Maybe even turn three, if you also have some ramp on, or on, on turn one or two. So, just a lot of value here. A lot that this card can do if you're in the right deck. And even if you're not in the right deck, if you're in limited and you happen to snag this thing, like, you definitely play it. Because as the game goes on, you can just start becoming copies of the bombs that your opponent's removing. And, uh, yeah, it can just win games. I mean, it's a rare, so I don't expect it to come up too often in Limited. But regardless, just a good card all around. And I'm excited to see where this, this card will land as far as constructed decks. So if you have an idea about where this card could slot in, definitely let me know in the comments. But that's going to do it for today. Uh, like I said, I do have another video coming pretty quickly. Uh, for day four spoilers, I'm trying to keep up with everything. Everything's coming out so, so quick, and it is a little bit hard to keep up with, but I am doing my best, so expect that video soon. Make sure you like the video if you haven't already, because it's you guys liking the videos every time that's helping this channel to grow so big, so quick. We're already well past 8,000 on our way to 9,000 subscribers, and it's kind of crazy. It still blows my mind how fast we're growing, so, uh, Definitely like the video if you haven't already. Subscribe if you're new so you don't miss any of my content. Tons of spoiler stuff coming. Tons of crazy deck text coming for Thunder Junction. And, of course, early access for Modern Horizons 3. I will be partaking in that. It will probably be a 24-hour marathon stream of me playing all sorts of crazy stuff. So look forward to that. I'll see you guys next time. And with that, take care. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. 
Without you guys, this channel would not be possible, so honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there. And if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately, that's somewhere up that way. Also, subscribe, circle below, do all the things.